I think it's so critical right now to understand who is truly high risk in smoldering myeloma, because this is now the decision making of whether we should treat those patients or not. And before we start treatment, we want to make sure that we are giving those patients the right classification, the right risk factors that indicate that they will progress to overt myeloma or to symptomatic myeloma. I'm a big proponent that active therapy early on would make a difference in the survival of patients, but I want to also make sure, as Dr. Kyle has told us, not to do harm and not to overtreat certain patients. And only by having the right risk stratifications for patients being accurate and precise, we will be able to detect who is truly at risk for progression in the next two years or in their next two years of their life. Uh, currently, we have many clinical factors, including the tumor burden, the light chain ratio, the monoclonal protein. The most current version of that is something called the Mayo 2220. And this was uh, then taken by the International Myeloma Working Group, building it up with over a thousand patients and trying to truly stratify patients who are at risk. Now, this is a great uh, model and it's an easy model. Anyone can use it. But I think we need to go on beyond that. We need to be able to give more precision for our patients and being uh, able to give them uh, the next level of data rather than just clinical markers and rather than just being a one-time measurement. So we can do better in the 21st century. And what I hope to bring in is other things. Can we bring in dynamic clinical evolution? We know that decrease in hemoglobin, increase in M spike and light chain can be predictive. Can we create a model that gives us this dynamic evolution for patients? Can we add in genomics? We know that the cytogenetic data when it was added to the Mayo 2220, improved significantly the precision of the progression of those patients. And instead of being a 50% chance of progression at two years, it was taken up to 70% chance. We know that we can do definitely more with the genomic data. And we recently published data on 214 patients showing us that indeed, if you add three factors that are genomic factors, you can have a much better prediction of who would progress to multiple myeloma. These are milk alterations, so translocation or amplification, MAP kinase mutations, KRAS and RAS and BRAF, and DNA repair mutations, ATM, ATR, P53, 17P deletion. And if you have one of those markers, even if you don't have the clinical data, you know that these patients are likely to progress very fast to active myeloma. They're already on the way to active myeloma. They're sort of this high, high risk disease. And if you even add it to the genomic data, of, to the clinical data of 20 to 20, then suddenly you have this precision of 70, 80% chance of progression. Now, a lot of people will tell me, well, genomic data is not available for everyone. And the answer is we do have fish and cytogenetics and we can bring in targeted panels available to everyone. It's very cheap to do next generation sequencing now. And we should not just limit ourselves to say, well, we can't do it. We can absolutely do it and bring it to our patients so that they have that ability to have precision in their hands to make a difference in deciding whether they should be treated or not. And I think the next level will be, of course, immune microenvironment. And we have shown recently that indeed the immune system is changing as early as MGUS. The question is, how can you use that to detect biomarkers that indicate who will progress and who is not going to progress? And can we use it to... Uh, truly um, to have a better sense whether this is a reaction to the clonal evolution or whether truly it is a permissive microenvironment that allows progression on its own. So I think the next five years will bring in more and more precision into understanding risk of progression from smoldering myeloma to overt myeloma.